Well, when I first started looking at GD&T stuff, uh, one of the things that I almost immediately thought is, what is the deal with all of these letters? Um, and so that is essentially what this presentation today is about, is what is the deal with all of the letters that we have in GD&T? Figured I would collect all of them into one presentation so we could talk about all of the different uh, letters. And many or most of them are modifiers. That's the official name that we use for these letters. Um, not, not all of them. We're going to talk about a couple of them that aren't technically modifiers. But these are ways that we can essentially kind of uh, really hone in on what exactly we mean um, about you know, certain of our tolerance zones and other things. And so I guess I'll have to just define them as we go along for these different, uh, these different letters. And uh, because you know, maybe I'm just weird that way, I wanted to see if these like, said anything. And so um, really what we have today is my flumpiest presentation. All right, this is the flumpiest presentation that I'm going to give in this class. So um, a few of the other things that we're going to talk about in here, these are a couple of other uh, notations that are not uh, technically modifiers. And then we have another kind of big aspect of what we're going to talk about today called bonus tolerances. And uh, this is another term that you'll see in a lot of GD&T parlance. And so I'm going to explain what we mean by bonus tolerances today. So we'll get on with it. Um, starting off here, let's talk about just where we've come so far. We've talked about several of the different kinds of geometric controls that we have available to us in GD&T. Um, those were summarized in this table. They are sort of in several different sort of classifications, form, profile, orientation, location, and runout. Um, and we've looked at some detail about how we can put uh, all, all of these controls or different ones of these controls into a feature control frame which is a place where you get to control a particular feature that is being put onto a mechanical drawing of some kind. All right. And what we have uh, skipped over a couple of times as we have started looking at these is these symbols that sometimes appear in the feature control frame. Often you will see like a circle M in there. And even though we've talked in here about that means that uh, that circle M means maximum material condition, we haven't really dug into what specifically it means to put that onto a feature control frame just yet. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, and there's other uh, controls that we're going to dig into today as well. So because this is probably the most commonly used of our modifiers, it is the maximum material condition modifier, I figured I'd put it first. Okay. So what it basically says is that you are supposed to apply the geometric control that is under consideration, you are supposed to apply that um, to a feature of size. So that's kind of my first point right here. What you apply this, this uh, modifier to is a geometric control that is itself applied to a feature of size. Okay, And what it says is you want to apply that control assuming that the feature of size is at maximum material condition. Okay. And so then the natural next question is, well, it, it has a tolerance built into that feature of size, so it doesn't have to be produced at maximum material condition. So what happens, what does it mean different if that feature of size gets produced at some uh, condition other than maximum material condition, right? So we put this modifier on there and say, apply this control when your feature is at maximum material condition. So the question is, what do you get to do if you produce the feature itself at less than maximum material condition? So instead of talking about it fully in an abstract way like that, let's apply it to a particular feature, OK? I'm showing you a part, a drawing of a part right here. This is the front view, and this is a side view over here. What you see based on these dotted lines is that we have a hole that's being drilled through this part, right? So this is an internal feature because it's a hole being drilled through the part. And we have this control being applied to that feature of size, right? The hole is a feature of size because you can measure opposing points across the hole, right? And um, we're applying this position control to that feature of size. And you'll notice that we put this maximum material condition modifier on the size of the tolerance zone. Right? It's after the size of the tolerance zone. 
So here's what that means. It means that if that feature of size gets produced where it's at maximum material condition, meaning what for that hole? Where does it have maximum amount of material present? Smallest hole possible. So if we're at the bottom range here, that's when we apply this uh, tolerance zone size of 0.2, okay? So then the question is, what do you get to do if you start making this feature with less material, meaning expanding the size of that hole? Okay, and here's the answer to that question. What you get to do is you get to actually start increasing the size of the tolerance zone, if you're the machinist, let's say, right? And you produce this thing and you produce the size of the hole to where it is less material than maximum material condition. What you get to do is the difference between where it would be at your maximum material condition and where it is at its actual produced size, you get to add that difference onto the size of the tolerance zone for the position control. Okay, here's what that looks like, right? There's the, that little cylinder right there represents the tolerance zone. And this little table summarizes what you get to do if you start moving away from maximum material condition. Okay, so at maximum material condition, you get zero of something that's called a bonus tolerance, right? Meaning you have to not have a tolerance zone cylinder any larger than what is said on the feature control frame. But let's say that you produce that hole instead of at uh, maximum material condition, you have 0.1 less than maximum material condition. What that allows you to do is add the difference between maximum material condition and that new uh, state that, that, you know, with less material present, you get to add that on to the, t the size of the tolerance zone cylinder, okay? So now think about this and tell me why does this make sense that this would be a thing you would allow? Right, so the larger the hole, the less tight you are in terms of your assemblability clearances. The hole gets larger, it's easy to easier to assemble it, which means you can be further off with where exactly the hole gets drilled, the position of the hole, right? So as you move toward least material condition, you get to be further and further off with where exactly you drill the hole. Okay, and you'll see this modifier get used on a lot of different drawings because very often the primary concern of the designer who put together the drawings is making sure that parts will assemble. And when you see that little modifier, that's very often what it is doing. As a matter of fact, probably almost all the time, that's what it's doing is trying to leave the machinist the most amount of possibilities to meet the design intent. So it has a tendency to reduce cost to essentially specify your tolerance with a uh, maximum material condition like this because it gives the machinist this bonus tolerance that they can dip into. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the way the math actually works, you can see it there in the table, but I'll mention it explicitly. Um, the bonus tolerance that you get is whatever your actual produced diameter is of the hole minus whatever your diameter would be at the maximum material condition for this example. Okay, now what if you have an external feature, right? This little thing right here, based on the view that you have from the other side, this is an external feature that you have protruding from the part. Maximum material condition for that feature implies what? Biggest possible diameter. And so you'll notice that's what they show right here is that the biggest of the acceptable range is at the top of the table, which means you don't get any bonus tolerance in that particular case. But as you start to produce that protrusion with less and less diameter, you get to start adding to the size of the tolerance zone cylinder that specifies where that protrusion has to be, right? Again, that is focused on assemblability uh, most likely. You know, that's what a designer is going to be probably thinking about when they specify a maximum material condition modifier like this on one of their uh, specifications. All right, and that's essentially what I say in that last bullet point. It makes for less expensive parts that you are assuring will assemble. All right, so then the next question is, we have this other modifier 
called the least material condition, right? Um, what it basically does is it also allows you to have bonus tolerances, but they work in a little bit different way, okay? What work, what the way it works in this case is, let's say that you don't get any bonus tolerance if you produce the feature at least material condition, and then as you move away from least material condition, you get to start adding bonus tolerance to your uh, geometric control that is being applied to the feature. Okay? Now, a lot of people would go, well, when would I need that? Right? So the answer to that question is, this particular control is most applicable when you are trying to ensure that you don't run out of material. Right? So an example here is we have this hole that's drilled really close to this sidewall of this part. Right? And if you drill this hole any larger, you could risk starting to actually bust into that sidewall right there, right? Or even if you don't bust into the sidewall, maybe this hole is required to carry some amount of stress. And if you make that part right there too thin, maybe it won't have the ability to carry the amount of stress that it needs to. And so as the designer, maybe you know sort of a minimum thickness that you need to make sure you have on this sidewall right here and this might be a place where you would want to specify a least material condition modifier because it basically says if you start producing it with less uh, diameter, meaning more material, then that means you get to have a little bit more leeway as to where that hole gets drilled without being worried about getting into being too close to this wall. Does that make sense? So that is kind of the primary use for least material condition modifiers, right? Uh, another place where that may occur sometimes is uh, sometimes you might make a casting. Some of you have, have probably done a process like this where you've made a casting and then you have a post process where you come back in and you cut on that casting. Well, in order to cut on the casting, the casting needs to have material there to cut on. And so it's not uncommon to see least material condition modifiers put on a part that is going to have another process happen to it later where it gets cut on, because that ensures that you have a certain minimum amount of material that could be cut on. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's least material condition. Um, S, so the modifier S means regardless of feature size. Okay, what does that sound like it means? It's actually what I put right here. It's abbreviated RFS, regardless of feature size. What do you think that means? No matter, yeah, it basically says you are uncoupling any sort of uh, you know, size tolerance from any sort of geometric control tolerance. You're basically saying they are independent of one another. Okay. Now, this modifier does not get used in ASME Y14.5. Why not, you think? Well, it is actually implied by default in that standard. Okay, so we don't actually use this modifier in that standard, but it does get used in the European standards uh, because they don't have that same default expectation like we do in the ASME standard. Okay, um, so if you don't put anything after your uh, tolerance values that you put on your feature control frames or after a uh, uh, you know, a datum or anything like that, if you don't put any modifier afterward, the presumption in the ASME standard is that it is a, uh, regardless of feature size, presumption, okay? Now, a good question might be, um, well, let me go through this first, I guess. Because you don't give machinists a bonus tolerance using a regardless of feature size uh, scenario, it actually makes it more restrictive on them and it can make it more expensive to produce the parts. Okay, so you want to try to think through what your design process is and if it is acceptable to give the machinist a maximum material condition, uh, something like that, it actually allows them more leeway in how they get an acceptable part produced. And that is, should be less expensive for them to do. Okay. Um, so now, why would we use a regardless of feature size modifier? All right, so where this really comes into play is let's say that you want to make sure 
that the tolerance that you are specifying controls where the center of a feature is. Think about what happens if you apply a bonus tolerance, like you say, I need these two parts to assemble, and let's say that the hole, you make the hole a little bit larger, which means that you can put the position off a little bit, right? Well, that means that the center of the actual produced feature may not be at the center of where you wanted it. And it could be you know, further off even than any of what, if your, uh, what your tolerance values would have made you think it would be because you have this bonus tolerance plus the original tolerance, okay? So if what you care about is to put a feature, the center of a feature in the place that you said you wanted it, right, and make sure that it doesn't deviate too far away from that location, you'll probably want to use a regardless of feature size type constraint or a type, you know, you won't use the modifier, it will be implied that way, but you will let it stay that way, okay? In this little drawing that I'm showing right here, the one that I wanted to pick off, because they actually put several of this S um, modifier in here, the first thing I'll point out is that this must not be a drawing according to Y14.5, right? Because you won't use that modifier if you're doing it in that way, okay? Um, but you'll notice that they apply this to several of the datums. I'm gonna get into kind of what does it mean to modify your datums here just a little bit, although that gets pretty tricky, and so I'm only gonna kind of do a surface treatment of it just a little bit. But the one I wanted to look at was this one right here, because in this case, we did a regardless of feature size modifier on this perpendicularity constraint. So what does that mean? Okay, what this means is that the size of the cylinder that controls the perpendicularity of this hole, because the, the, uh, the tolerance zone is this cylinder that controls the center of that thing, right, the center of the actual produced cylinder, there's a tolerance zone cylinder that's inside of there that controls the center of that feature. What we're saying is we don't want to allow the size of the cylinder that controls perpendicularity to grow or shrink um, just because we have gone up or down in the actual produced size of the hole. We want the perpendicularity to be controlled according to this value, whether or not the size of the hole increases or decreases, okay? That's probably not primarily designed for assemblability. It might be designed more for things like alignment, right? Maybe you're gonna wanna press something into this hole and make sure that it's within a certain range of perpendicularity or something along those lines, okay? So that's uh, a sample of what we're talking about with regardless of feature size. But again, you won't see that symbol in the ASME standard because it is implied by default. All right, so here is where we're talking about datums. We can also apply the maximum material uh, type construct. We call it a little bit different thing. We call it a maximum material boundary if you apply it to a datum feature, okay? And where you actually see this get applied is in the feature control frame modifying the datum itself, okay? So after datum A, it puts this maximum material condition uh, or maximum, excuse me, material boundary that you apply to that datum as you go about trying to make sure that these holes are positioned properly. So what do you think that might mean? Okay, this is maybe not something that you'll just guess what it means, but in order to inspect whether or not these holes are actually produced on this center line, that's kind of what this is saying needs to happen, right? This is datum A is the center line of this part, right? And it seems to imply, uh, based on this position control, that that hole should lie on that center line within a cylindrical tolerance zone of size 0 0.003, right? That's what this seems to be saying. But then it adds this, uh, you know, maximum material boundary on that datum. So now the question is, how do you inspect whether or not these holes really do lie on that center line? You probably need some kind of tooling to do that, right? Some kind of tooling that will probably bear against this side wall over here and this side wall over here, and maybe puts a pin or something like that up through the middle so that you can tell whether or not this part is made so that the holes are within tolerance to having the hole be in the middle, maybe something along those lines. What this M does over here is it says, hey, 
that datum that you're using, that is the center line of this feature, is actually somewhat linked to the size of the feature, right? Especially when you go to try to inspect it. If you have two plates and now you've made, you know, you, let's say you make a plate down here and a plate down up here that are the largest size possible that this plate or that this piece could be, and it'll fit in between those two uh, boundaries, right? Um, well, what happens if you produce this part closer to less material, right? Less material present, closer to the smaller size. What happens with your testing jig? You now have space that has opened up between the two boundaries that you're using to inspect this part. What this modifier over here says is, hey, if you happen to produce that, uh, you know, datum feature, which is a feature of size, right? If you happen to produce it at smaller size, then when you go to inspect it, you are allowed to let the part like rotate and translate inside of your testing jig in order to find whether or not the pins will go through the holes. It essentially allows you some rotation and translation when you go to inspect the part, assuming that your uh, datum feature was produced at less than maximum material. Is that interesting? So it doesn't really provide you with a bonus tolerance per se, but it does allow more leeway in how the part gets inspected and it will allow you to say that some parts that you would have rejected without that modifier there will now get accepted. And it's again focused probably primarily on assemblability, right? Because um, if you have less material there, then the chances of you being able to fit it within the space that it needs to fit as greater, right? Because you have less material present, okay? Now, this one is even harder to describe. Where would you need to use a least material boundary, okay? And here's an example of where one is being used for this datum feature B, right? Datum feature B is implied by where this hole is and says there's two different holes, uh, you know, present right there. That's what the 2x means right here. And, um, you know, what it basically says up here is that um, you're going to do this profile control where you apply a least material boundary on datum B. Okay, what does it look like they are trying to control there? Right? Let's say it this way. This looks like it's a hole that if it was drilled too big, is there a possibility it could get into this outer surface of this thing? Okay, so essentially what they're doing is they're saying, um, as you, let's say you make this hole the biggest it can possibly be, you need to make sure that this outer boundary doesn't deviate too far or else you could get into space where that hole might be or you might have too thin of a wall, right? But as you begin to make these holes smaller and smaller, meaning more and more material, it allows you, um, I guess, less motion of the part and that sort of gives you more leeway as far as, you know, whether or not you can have um, additional uh, leeway, I guess, is the best way I can put it as far as the surface on the outside of this part. And I don't even really know what this part does, but I'm, I'm interpreting how I look at that. And, um, you know, but this one's much more difficult uh, sort of to describe and even to try to describe to you how you would gauge it. Um, it's, it's kind of more difficult to understand. So my goal is at some point to do a uh, more thorough presentation um, on these two uh, modifiers right here. There's another one that also applies to datums and it's called free to translate, okay? So free to translate basically says, this is a kind of an interesting one to describe as well. Look at this part over here. You have your primary datum. If you look at all your datum, uh, or excuse me, feature control frames, if you look at all these feature control frames, they're all in ABC order right? So it's pretty obvious that the designer of this thing meant for A to be your primary datum just about any, any way you look at it, okay? So that's your primary datum, and then B is your secondary datum. Where's B? That top hole. Here's how you interpret that. You are first thinking about laying this piece on a flat surface, and then you are going to use a pin that's approximately this size to locate where the position is of the top part of this piece. 
So that constrains five of your six degrees of freedom for this part. What's the only direction it can still move? Rotationally around what? Around the pin up here, okay? So you have, to, you have one more constraint that you have to put on here, and what is it, you know, if you kind of think about what that constraint would be, it is sort of clock angle around that pin. So your third datum that you set up for this part is datum C, and it is applied to this hole down here. So the purpose of that is to try to keep this part from rotating around the pin up here. Do you care about what position this hole is up and down in order to control clock angle? Not really. You only, you only really care about where this hole is positioned sort of left and right. Okay. What the free to translate modifier says, like when you apply this free to translate um, to some of these other features downstream of where you have established uh, your datum C, what that says is datum C, when you define this thing, the datum feature simulator that you use to inspect it or whatever, you are allowed to let that pin move up and down wherever it needs to, to fit into that hole. It allows you movement in the direction that doesn't matter, basically. Does that kind of make sense? So um, that's essentially what that little arrow means or that little triangle means at the end of that last thing. It says free to translate. And sort of an instruction about how you can build a datum feature simulator uh, in order to check whether or not this part worked. Um, and then I've mentioned this already. Um, these concepts are, are kind of advanced and as far as like where exactly do you use them and how do you use them. So again, I'm going to hopefully at some point in the future develop another lecture where I kind of dig into them a little bit deeper. All right, this is the funniest thing that I have to show you today. Okay. Um, and this is not my example. I, I pulled it from this website right here, so I do appreciate it. Um, but so unequally disposed tolerance. I talked about this a little bit when we started talking about um, our, you know, these are profile controls over here. Uh, you can have profile controls that have an unequally disposed uh, tolerance to two sides. And this was a funny example, so I thought I'd share it. Um, the example is this. Let's say that you have a dog and dog, you know, the dog's name is Spot and he's in this yard. And, you know, on your end, you would like for Spot to, uh, to defecate the farthest away possible from your house. So you want him out to the boundaries, right? The problem is your neighbors don't really appreciate it much if Spot is out there and defecating in their yards, right? And so where you, you st maybe first start thinking of, well, I'm gonna put a little boundary here about you know, where it's okay for Spot to go out there and uh, relieve himself, right? Now, Spot goes out there and starts doing that, but the neighbors aren't super happy. What did the neighbors want? They want it to not go over the property line. They can't really control that, you know, Spot might poop right up to the edge of the property line, but they don't want him to go over, right? And so the way you would specify that using these controls is you would say the boundary around the yard is the profile, right? And by default, what we had up here was that you have this tolerance that would be equally disposed to either side of that profile. If you want to change that and modify it, what you do is you throw in this modifier U, and then you put in how much is allowed to be to the outside of the material. In our case, the outside of the yard. So in order to make your neighbors happy, you do this unequally disposed profile and then you put in a zero, meaning none of it is allowed to be to the outside of that profile that you have defined. Okay, now let's say you try to train Spot that way and Spot doesn't quite get it right at first. He's smart, but he may not be that smart. So he tries, right? And he starts getting better. And so what he actually does is goes to this tolerance level where 
you know, maybe occasionally he's on the other side of the boundary by a little bit, but mostly he's to the inside, right? So this is an unequally disposed profile, and you'll notice there's a value right there no longer zero. What does it say now, right? If it's a total of, let's say, five feet of width, two of those can be to the outside, and the remainder is going to be to the inside. So that's how you read this unequally disposed profile. Um, I didn't really talk about this, but what does this symbol mean here where you have A, arrow, B? A, to B. a around to B, right? And you'll notice there that the way he labeled this, he, he put a point A right here, and he put a point B right here. And so that basically describes that that profile goes around that way. Okay, that's a review. We've already talked about that, but mention it again. Yes, sir. If you put a five after that five, so five U five, would that represent? That would represent all of, the all of it is to the outside. So you could specify that. You could specify that. Your neighbors wouldn't be happy, right, if it was applied to this particular uh, scenario, but you could do that. Yeah. Um, that's not the way most of it works. So the question was, is there a way that you could specify this according to things like percentages as opposed to absolute units? And um, I have not seen something like that. I, I uh, am reluctant to claim that there is no possible way to do that, but um, I haven't really seen it that way. Uh, most of the things that we see in here are kind of in all of these tolerancing things, they are almost always dealing with length dimensions, right? Occasionally angles, but you know, they, uh, those are things that I, I think are fairly easy for us to define geometry based on those lengths, and so they tend to do it that way. But that is a good question. If I run across something that says something different, I'll let you know. If you want all of your tolerance zone to be inside of the profile, you would put zero, right? If you want all of your tolerance zone to be outside of the profile, you know, right there on the edge, then you would match whatever the size of the profile was, or, or excuse me, the size of the tolerance zone, you would match that with the, the amount that you are unequally disposed to the outside. All right, this is another one that's very, very handy right here. This is called a projected tolerance zone. Um, with a projected tolerance zone, this is useful because a lot of parts that you make might be assembled such that there maybe is one part that you have to install a bolt or a stud into that part, and then you have to put another part to the outside of that. And if you misalign the hole uh, such that it's maybe angularly misaligned, then that actually has the effect of taking the stud that you're going to you know, install in the hole, and it'll extend out angularly misaligned. And when you go to a, install the part that is supposed to mate with that, it starts to create a problem because essentially that stud projects out from the part that where the actual hole was drilled that holds the stud. Does that make sense? So one of the things we can do about that is we can actually refine our tolerance zone so that it basically, um, you know, our, our by default, our tolerance zone on a hole, like if we do a positional control like this, the tolerance zone is going to be this cylinder that has the diameter that is specified in the positional control, right? And by default, the, the length of that cylinder only extends out to the length of the feature by default. So if you want to actually refine this a little bit more, what you can do is you can specify that you want for the length of that tolerance zone to extend out beyond the end of where the feature itself is, right? And so what that would look like is something like this, right? You have essentially established this tolerance zone. You might give it even the same size as you had originally, but you have put a, an additional modifier on here that says you're going to project that tolerance zone to a length outside of the feature itself. Right, so in this case, you're extending by 20, uh, probably millimeters, right? But you're going to extend by 20 units beyond the feature itself and use that to define the tolerance zone. Okay, and this is a good way of uh, essentially ensuring uh, 
that parts where you have like protruding features where the angle of protrusion particularly, um, you know, if the angle of that protrusion depends on how you drilled the hole in the, in the first place, you might want to apply a tolerance like this to the hole, right, as one example. Cool, right? Okay, and I already mentioned this, but the number after the P symbol represents how far outside the material you project. This one's interesting right here because it uh, represents a you know, kind of a scenario that you may not have thought about yet, but a lot of parts may be inspected in some other state besides just uh, stress-free, okay? This is actually very common for uh, sheet metal parts. So some, some of the parts that you need to inspect will be flexible, and there are sometimes uh, notes given about how you are supposed to flex the part before you go to inspect it, okay? In this case right here, it says um, datum A with 20 pounds applied opposite datum feature A. Okay, or tolerance is applied when part is constrained to datum A with 20 pounds applied opposite datum feature A. Right, that basically means you're going to put a force on the opposite side of datum feature A, which is right down here, um, and then you're going to inspect the part in that scenario. All right. Um, so kind of the presumption is maybe this face right here is not naturally flat and you're going to push it against a flat surface and then inspect the part in that scenario. Now, maybe you do want that face to be flat to within some tolerance before you do that inspection with it pressed in that way. So how do you tell it to, how do you give that instruction to the person who's going to inspect the part? Well, what you can do is you know, again, it's assumed you're going to be uh, in a free state unless you have some kind of a note or something like that on the diagram, which we do, right? So now the note says don't inspect it in a free state, but maybe there are certain bits of the inspection we want to do still in a free state. So what you see happen here is we have this modifier right here saying F, and it says inspect the flatness of this face before you constrain it. Right before you press it against your datum feature simulator so that you can start doing the rest of the inspection, um, check and see whether or not the flatness of this face meets some requirement. And so they basically relax this note over here by putting this modifier on that particular uh, geometric control. Cool, right? <clears throat> And again, I think I mentioned this, but this is a common thing to see if you're making sheet metal parts. They often need to be inspected instead of just in a free state, in some kind of a constrained state, but then maybe some of your inspections you might want to do not in a constrained state. Yeah. Yes, anything that's flexible, right? It doesn't have to just be sheet metal. That was the question, does it have to be sheet metal? No, anything where the inspection technique requires the part to be flexed, right? Um, you know, then you might have some kind of instructions in the, you know, how to inspect the part. You might have some instructions there about how to do that. But if you want to then relax those, uh, you can apply a free state modifier and say, don't apply these instructions when you check that. All right, here's another one, T. All right, tangent plane. So by default in the ASME standard, when you set up a tolerance zone, you are kind of by default saying you want all surface points to lie within the tolerance zone. That's kind of by default what it says. The tangent plane modifier says um, maybe you don't care whether or not you have certain localized points that dip outside of your tolerance zone, right? And instead, you would like to inspect what is the effect of putting a planar piece against the surface and where is that planar piece going to lie, right? So you can look at a surface like this and you say, I'm not going to inspect it based on whether or not all the surface points lie within the uh, tolerance zone. 
I'm going to inspect it based on once I place a planar piece on the outside of it like this, does that lie within the tolerance zone, right? And so you apply this modifier of T to give instruction to say that's how you're going to inspect it, okay? It's essentially, if it's a plane, then it's probably going to be controlled by the three highest points, uh, at least in theory, right? So uh, this gets a little bit more complicated once you figure out that um, you know many parts actually do have a little bit of an elasticity to them, right? So if you have a very, very tiny highest point, then hypothetically you could push that highest point down a little bit and you could end up having more points of contact than just that. But it's a, the, the intuition you had there is correct. Yeah. Right, so it could be that you would really only have kind of in this view anyway, you might really only have two places that you would see touch, maybe. Uh, or maybe three places that you would see touch if you kind of imagine um, this view including multiple uh, depths, right? You might see three different places that a point would touch. Um, all right, so that's what we mean there. Um, here's another one, E. This is a instruction that says you need to require um, an envelope requirement. So this is interesting because this is an explicit way of saying it basically what rule one says already in ASME standard. It basically says, um, do not let any of the points uh, escape outside of the maximum material condition envelope, okay? For that reason, uh, that's kind of what we're looking at right over there, right? You say, here is the size of the piece. You put the little E after it. It says that none of these points can escape outside of the uh, maximum material condition. Right. This modifier is not used in ASME standard. What do you think that means? Again, this is what you assume by default, right, is that you are going to apply this envelope uh, standard, right? This is essentially what rule one says, right? That's what we actually already studied was that once you have specified a particular um, size tolerance on a feature of size, that also controls form to a certain level, okay? <clears throat> and uh, this, the reason for the envelope requirement has to do with assemblability. In order for two parts to assemble, you wanna make sure that when you have maximum material condition, you don't have any points that lie outside of that because that is the, essentially the boundary that you have counted on uh, must not be violated by the other part, right? So that's, that's kind of why we would need the envelope requirement. Um, because it is implied by default in the ASME standard, you don't ever see the E modifier on ASME uh, standard drawings, but you do see an I modifier. And that is because I is basically the counterpart of E. Okay, this is an independency modifier, and it basically says, what if you would like to relax the envelope principle that is native to the ASME standard? Okay, so where's an example of that? Let's say that you have a little flat piece of, of material here, and you need for the thickness of that flat piece of material to only be between 10.7 and 10.8. So let's say that the size of that thing is important to get to that level, okay? Because you have specified it this way, it will, by default, control the form of this flat piece to a level that is essentially at point one, right? In other words, it can't let the outermost boundary of this thing, if this was produced to where the thickness everywhere was 10.7, then it could flex far enough to the point where the, maybe at this end, you know, it was right at the, at the threshold on this end and then it curved uh, up here to where it bumped right up against maximum material condition envelope on that side and then came back down. But you would have implied a flatness of 0.01 by default just by putting this size tolerance on there. What if you don't care about flatness to that level? And you didn't mean to imply that, you just did because that's rule, what rule one says. Well, here's what you can do about it. What you can do is you can 
specify those tolerances and then put a little I next to it right there. What that says is don't worry about rule one like you normally would, okay? And instead, uh, kind of specify what the flatness is of this part based on a separate control. And notice how the size of that separate control is more loose, right? So essentially you relaxed the requirement that was given by rule one and you are now um, you know, taking over with a flatness control that is actually looser. If you didn't put this I right there, then you would have to revert back to rule one and this over here would kind of not be useful at all because you would have a tighter control with rule one than with that one. Make sense? Okay. Um, here's another interesting one. This one is, uh, I don't think this one's technically called a modifier, but they are more letters that you're gonna see on some of your drawings, and so I figured I'd talk about it. This is a continuous feature instruction, okay? And uh, there's a couple of different ways, you know, some of you looking at this might say, that looks like it might be some kind of a swivel or a quick connect or something like that. And that very well might be what it is, but there's a couple of different ways that you can specify the tolerances on all of these little kind of cylindrical pieces that would be down the length of this part. One way is over here and say, you have three different surfaces, this one, this one, and this one, where we are going to specify a size tolerance uh, according to, you know, size and a tolerance according to this uh, dimension right here, okay? Now, does that control do anything to control the concentricity of these three parts? Not really. This one can meet that requirement separately from this one meeting that requirement and they can be misaligned from one another, right? So for that reason, this technique of specifying um, all of these three surfaces may be undesirable if one of the things that you want is to get concentricity of those three surfaces. So what's the solution to that? An easy solution to that is to basically put this little uh, note to the side of your tolerance right there that says continuous feature. What that says is look at the part and think about what the manufacturing process is likely to be on that part. What it's likely to be is that you're first going to make a cylinder and then you're going to cut grooves into that cylinder, right? When it says CF, that means think of that original cylinder as being a continuous feature that is controlled according to this tolerance, right? And then once you've thought of that that way, then think about cutting grooves into it, right? So that's kind of what the CF uh, instruction means. <clears throat> All right, here's another one, statistical tolerance, right? Um, this is based on this concept that just about any manufacturing process that you're gonna see out there, the actual result of the process is going to be distributed according to some statistical distribution, okay? And uh, so a lot of companies who deal with um, very, I guess, higher end quality control techniques, instead of it being sort of these tolerances as, as like strict fences, what they do is they measure every single part and they try to track where is the mean and standard deviation going for the different dimensions that matter to the production of that part. And a statistical tolerance is one that says, let's try to control that mean and standard deviation to within particular parameters. And so there would have to be a whole other um, kind of infrastructure behind that that would actually allow you to do those statistical tolerances. And that's outside the scope of what we're gonna do in here. But that basically depends on an infrastructure in place where the company has basically decided that they are going to try to control their tolerances using a little bit more of a statistical technique as opposed to strict fences, okay? But there is actually some middle ground. In the standard, in the ASME standard, it allows you to apply sort of a hybrid of the two where you say, we're gonna try to control this with statistical controls, but then we are also 
going to apply some strict limits within which we, we will not allow it to vary outside of that, right? So it provides with this method where it says, here's your limits of the size that you can have right here. You're gonna control it using statistical controls, but you have actually um, set a particular hard limit on what those are allowed to be. Notice here that the statistical control is based on a uh, constraint down to one level, and then you have another level that is being constrained as sort of your hard limits. So anyway, that's, a statistical control. These last um, few symbols that I wanted to mention here are counterboring, countersinking, spot facing, and depth instructions. Again, these are not really controls, but they are symbols that you will see pop up on drawings, and they are worthwhile kind of talking what talking about what they mean. Um, so the first of them that I will talk about is this one over here on the left, where it's essentially an instruction that says you're going to drill, let's say, a 10 millimeter hole. Then you're going to do a 20 millimeter bore on top of that to a, and then the depth of the bore is going to be eight, probably millimeters here. So that's saying the depth of this bore is going to be eight millimeters. Okay. That is a way that you can actually get fasteners to sit flush with a surface of a part that's being fastened. That's often desirable, right? Sometimes you don't want fasteners to protrude. So maybe you want to build your part so that the fastener will sort of be recessed inside of the part, okay? Another method of doing this is called countersinking. And the symbol to get that is this little V, right? Up here it's shown with this little V. Um, and it basically says a very similar thing, but it also gives what the um, angle needs to be on that countersink. Right, and a 90 degree angle uh, on the countersink basically says what should those what should those uh, slopes be of those walls uh, of the countersink. Okay, um, this gives you a also a diameter that it should be at the top of the of that cone shape. Um, a spot face is fundamentally not really much different than a counter bore, other than how deep it goes. The point with a spot face is not that you're trying to recess the head of a fastener usually, it's usually that you are trying to get a flat surface that the fastener can bear against, right? Flat and smooth surface that the fastener can bear against. And so there's a couple of different aspects where that um, may be necessary. One of them is what if you have a casting that has a rough surface and you would like to have a smooth surface for the uh, fastener to bear against, you might want to do a spot face in that particular instance. Um, over here, it is a situation where you have this hole that's drilled on a flange, but then there's another piece, another uh, feature of that part that kind of comes up alongside where that hole is. And if you don't do something special there, you might end up having the head of your fastener run into that fillet. So what do you do about that? Well, you can specify a spot face and that will take off some of that material and again, leave a nice, flat, smooth surface for the underside of the fastener to bear against. Okay. <clears throat> so these are some more symbols that you might see pop up and now we've talked about what they mean. All right. So that's all I've got for today. We, uh, we just had our flumpiest presentation. So I'll see you later.